Hello and welcome everybody and thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kate Schwanhauser and I am the events manager here at Food and Water Watch and I'm just so excited that you all are here to join us this evening for our first Livable Future live event of the new year. Um, and I'm very excited that today's topic um, is a very special event uh, that will dive into our executive director Winona Howder's 2023 book of the year. So at the end of every year, she takes a look back and chooses the book that stood out to her as the most memorable, the most thought-provoking, the most timely book that she read. And for 2023, that was The Great Displacement, Climate Change, and the Next American Migration. And we are very lucky to be joined this evening by the book's author, Jake Biddle. And in a few minutes, he and Winona are going to dive into a discussion of the book. Um, I do just want to give people another minute to keep getting logged in. So in the meantime, I just have a couple of reminders uh, and announcements for some other upcoming events that we hope you'll join us for this, this spring. Um, so first, if you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, just click on the show captions button that you see at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar to turn those on. You can continue to use the chat box this evening as a space to share your thoughts and have a conversation with others that are here with us tonight. And we will have some time at the end for Q&A with Jake. So if you have questions as you're listening, please add those to the Q&A box throughout the discussion. And finally, I am recording this evening's event and I'll be sharing a link to that later this week. So as we start off the new year, I just want to welcome anyone who might be new to Food and Water Watch. Thanks for being here with us. Um, we are a national organization fighting for sustainable food, clean water, and a livable climate for all of us. And we believe that it's grassroots activism at all levels of government, whether that's local, state, or federal, that's what's gonna create the change and the solutions that we need. And that's why it's just always so inspiring to see so many people join us at events like this, to hear from experts, engage on the issues, and take action alongside us. Um, and, you know, I think we all know that we've got an especially important year ahead of us and Food and Water Watch will be doing everything that we can to take on factory farms, to keep our water safe from toxic chemicals and fight fossil fuel projects across the country. You can check out our top 10 priorities for the year. We'll put that in the chat for you. And I invite you to get engaged with us along the way, whether that's making a donation or joining our volunteer network. There are just so many ways that you can be a part of this. Uh, I'd also like to invite you to join us for some of our other upcoming events in the next few months. In February, we will be sitting down with members of our legal team and community members who are involved in some key cases to talk about how we're using the legal system to really challenge regulatory agencies and reshape the way that we monitor and protect um, water and air quality from polluters like factory farms. And then in March, Food and Water Watch's sister organization, Food and Water Action, will be hosting an election launch party with some special guests to kick off what we know is a very critical election year and talk about how you can help get out the vote. Uh, and finally, before we get started, I know that many of you have joined us for previous Livable Future Live events, and I would love to hear your thoughts. I've got a quick survey uh, that we'll put a link uh, to in the chat for you. Please share your feedback on our events program and what you'd like to see more of this year. It will really help shape our programming for the year ahead. And if you fill out that survey, you'll be entered for a chance to win a copy of The Great Displacement, which we'll be discussing here in just a moment. Um, all right, so that is enough um, from me for the moment. So as I've mentioned, uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Jake Biddle, the author of The Great Displacement. The book talks about how climate change is reshaping where and how people live. Climate caused disasters, things like hurricanes, floods, wildfires, rising sea levels. They're forcing entire communities from their homes, and these large-scale displacements are happening all across the country. And as I mentioned, every year, our executive director, Winona Howder, chooses a book of the year, and this was her 2023 selection for the way that it really grapples with these complicated issues of climate change, housing and insurance markets, government policy, and so much more. There's so much that goes into this. Um, and in a really human way, the book has so many really powerful stories of people who are displaced by climate disasters, and it turns something that can feel really removed and statistical at times to something that feels very personal. 
Um, I found it to be a very powerful and moving book, and I'm sure many of you did as well. Um, and we are thrilled that Jake can be here with us this evening so that the two of them can talk about this book and climate migration in the U.S. So let me do some introductions and then I will turn things over to them. So um, first off, Jake, in addition to researching and writing this book, is a reporter who covers climate, energy, and housing, and is currently a staff writer at Grist, where he covers climate impacts and adaptation. Um, and Winona is the executive director of Food and Water Watch, which she founded in 2005, to channel the power of grassroots activism to fight for a future with clean, affordable water, sustainable food, and a livable climate. Uh, thank you so much, Winona and Jake, for being here this evening. Really glad to have you for this discussion. Well, it is fantastic to be here this evening. And Jake, so much, thank you so much for joining me. So I really nice. enjoyed the book. And I wondered what drew you to the topic of climate migration? Yeah, I think that when I started working on the book in 2020, I was kind of frustrated because at the time there seemed to be very little coverage of climate change as a present tense issue in the United States. Like there was a lot of coverage of projections of what could happen with climate change and effects that were already tangible on the other side of the world, for instance. But it seemed pretty clear from prior research that I had done that it was already causing, you know, sort of big impacts in the United States. And, and as I sort of started to research those impacts, I had mostly reported on housing before writing about climate change. And it became clear to me that, you know, one of the biggest impacts in the United States where we have like a, a where, you know, it's a it's a highly developed country. One of the biggest impacts was like people would lose their homes, they would be displaced from their communities and they would get pushed into our rather brutal housing and insurance markets. Right. So whereas in, you know, some of the least developed countries, like some of the biggest you know uh, victims of climate change are like smallholder farmers or pastoralists, for instance, like. It seemed like in the United States, the primary way that people experience the impacts of climate change right now, most people at least, was that, you know, it destroyed their home or made their homes unlivable. So I started from that point of what would it look like to sort of diagnose climate driven housing displacement in the United States today. And that was the origin point of the book, basically. So the Great Displacement is a reference to the Great Migration, that period between 1920 and 1970, when Black people left the South and moved to Northern cities and the West Coast. So what similarities and differences do you see between these two migrations? Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest similarity is just the the scale, right? Like the Great Migration was one of the largest migration events in U.S. history. And, you know, according to at least most statistics, right, in all but the best case scenarios for climate change, probably as many people would be displaced over a comparable or even shorter amount of time in the United States. And I think just like the Great Migration, right, like it has the potential to reshape, you know, the sort of demography and the economy of the United States. That's kind of where the similarities end, though. And, you know, a reason why I chose the term displacement was because, like, I wanted to contrast it to the Great Migration, which was like a primarily you know, one directional, right? Like people moved from one place to another on purpose. And, and the moves were, you know, in many cases, most cases, they were voluntary, right? They were fleeing something, but also they were seeking, you know, better employment, et cetera, better treatment in the North. And they mostly didn't come back, right? So whereas like the displacement movement that I was trying to track was much more chaotic and much more diffuse. Yeah. Like people moved everywhere. They moved multiple times. They left and they came back. They'd moved, you know, only when they absolutely had to. So I was trying to sort of say this looks more like, um, you know, like a mass eviction or something where everyone kind of goes everywhere haphazardly than it does like a, a migration event. You know, the other main comparison would be the Dust Bowl, right, where people left from one place yeah. and they went to another place. They were pushed by a climate disaster. But that was much more coherent migration than you know the one that I was trying to track, which is like sort of from everywhere and to everywhere all at once. So there's more differences than similarities, but the scale is 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 probably pretty similar. 
So I think that when most people hear climate migration, they're thinking about other places in the world, small islands that are being impacted as the ocean rises. For people who aren't familiar with the term, can you talk about what it means and what it actually looks like? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of a tricky term. Like in the years since I started working on the book, I think it's gotten a lot more like attention. It's come into currency a lot more. And yeah, like you said, it's it's mostly been used to describe really large scale projections of migration from the least developed countries to Europe and North America. Right. So and and there's examples of this, right, like migration from Guatemala in the aftermath of hurricanes, right, migration from North Africa after famine and drought, like to Europe. This does happen. Um, but the vast majority of climate migration, and this is where you can encompass the United States as well, is is internal, right? Like it happens within one country. If you look at, for instance, the floods that happened in Pakistan in 2022, an enormous number of people moved. Very few of them left Pakistan. And in, in many cases, international migration is like a, a, a postlude or like an epilogue to a, an internal displacement event. And so I was kind of, I mean, at the beginning, I was kind of frustrated with the term because I felt like it, it it gives people the wrong image of the movement that results from climate change. But, and also I don't like the sort of like, it was used, it was kind of weaponized sometimes in xenophobic yeah. ways. But um, but I think it's still like, it, that's the term that we have and that's the term that people use. And, but it just doesn't look a lot like our image of migration. Well, can you talk a little bit about the aftermath of a disaster? Things like people being um, priced out of insurance premiums. Yeah, I mean, things just go completely haywire in the aftermath of a disaster. You know, in the first couple of weeks, like it's it's just it's just horrifying. Like, you know, you have opportunistic contractors come in and try to help you fix your home. Nobody knows how to get in touch with FEMA. Like nobody knows where anybody is. And then as soon as that dust clears, so to speak, like there's a massive increases in housing prices. Many people, you know, if they don't get temporary housing assistance from their insurer or from FEMA, they just have no choice but to scatter to the four winds. And then later on, as you said, like, and you know, there's any number of things that happen in between. Like it really is frenzied and very different in every place. But, um, you know, later on then, once the losses have been assessed, right? Then you have like insurers, they react quite negatively. They say, whoa, we had to pay out tens of millions of dollars. We want to get out of here. We want to cut our losses. And then, you know, only later, like in the years after, you know, I'm talking three to five years, does long term recovery money trickle in from the federal government, right? Like then you have the Department of Housing and Urban Development and some of these grant programs from FEMA that are, they nominally are supposed to help communities recover and become more resilient. But, you know, usually the first three to five years before that happens is just like it's kind of like privation and chaos and it's just a mess. Right. And we just don't have the ability like the government, the federal government just right now doesn't have the ability to wrap its hands around this. And they just struggle to keep up with they just struggle to respond at the necessary speed to the you know displacement and and chaos that gets caused in the housing markets. Well, you know, I have noticed that sometimes people aren't very sympathet sympathetic to those who have been living through fires or floods. Um, people say, why do they live there? Why don't they just move? Did you encounter that sentiment from people when you were researching the book? And how did you respond if you did? Yeah, I mean, that, that sentiment is is uh ubiquitous right and it, it's it's really really hard to um there's a kind of like i mean it's not to say condescension but there's kind of like a, a, a an attitude of of derision sometimes for people who and leave it like live in these places that have repeated events like i think it, after katrina like dennis haster got on the floor of the house of representatives i think he said like we shouldn't rebuild new orleans right like we should not and it's just like i mean 
there are places in the U.S. that are far more risky than other places. Like, that's true. But I don't think it I just don't think that we can. I was really interested in the the reasons why somebody might want to stay somewhere. Right. And I, I found that there were numerous. Right. Sometimes there's economic reasons why it's difficult to leave. Right. That that happens a lot just as often as there's economic reasons why someone can't stay. But also, the, you know, there's just like deep sort of family and cultural and the sort of spiritual ties that people have to specific areas. And it's just they just don't see it that way. Right. Like, first of all, they don't have the attitude of like, this is something that I can't live with. In a lot of cases, they see it as a risk that they're willing to deal with. And a lot of times they're quite um, perceptive about the, you know, increasing risk of flooding or hurricanes or whatever. And they just choose to stay. But then other times it's leaving just isn't an option for any number of reasons. So, yeah, that's something that I, I heard, you know, less from people who I interviewed and more just from people who I would talk to personally about the project. Right. Um, but I was I always found it a little bit. Um, I just I find it unpleasant, like kind of sentiment. And I just think it's like, you know, in, in the fact that I was interviewing everyone and trying to like tell their stories, it just wasn't something that I could really make room for because it, it, was, it was a sort of sympathy for them. Yeah, it's really chilling um, when people have that kind yeah. of lack of sympathy. And I mean, one of the things that I found so compelling about your book was the interviews and the stories you told about people. I mean, it just really resonated on a human level. Was there an interview or a story that really stands out the most to you? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I think that, I think one of them, like one of the chapters um, takes place in, in South Louisiana, like about two hours south of New Orleans. And there was a, there was like an, there's a very famous case of a of a, an indigenous community that was, uh, they, they underwent like a whole community relocation that was funded in part by the Obama administration. It was called Il de Jean Charles. It was, you know, notorious it was known as like the first case of whole community climate migration in the United States. Um, and I went down there initially thinking that I would report on that. Um, but I, I stopped like one town before to a town that wasn't known for being in the midst of a whole community climate relocation. It hadn't received that funding. And I just went to go get like lunch there. And um, they were all freaking out because they had just learned that the only school in this town, which is farther inland, but still exposed to flooding, was going to be closed. This is a school that was 70% indigenous in terms of the student body. And they were just like, this is the end of our town. And there was just as they, they were also undergoing a, a community relocation, but it was involuntary and it was uh, disorganized and it wasn't funded by anybody. People were just leaving because there was like a massive amount of disinvestment. Um, and I just, I like, you know, I, that ended up being what I wrote the chapter about, right. It was like, what happens when there isn't a program for relocation? I mean, we could talk at length about the Jean Charles program. There's lots to say about it, but I was struck by how much, like there was so many stories of this happening in places where I wasn't even looking, you know, and just happenstance that I, that I was there the day that they had found out about the school that always struck me. Like it was just always seemed so much bigger than I was prepared to to understand. Yeah, your story about Louisiana, a uh, real tragedy in so many ways, like the oil companies slicing up the bayou to make room for their equipment and causing that terrible erosion and so many other problems. So you recently wrote an article in Grist that I thought was really important uh, because we do a lot of work on liquefied natural gas. And it was called Death Stars on Sinking Land, how liquefied natural gas took over the Gulf. Can you bring us up to speed a little bit about what's happening on Louisiana's coast and um, the reporting that you did recently? Yeah, yeah, it was so interesting because it kind of grew out of this reporting that I had done on the sea level rise risk there. And after I had spoken to people down there, you know, both in Southeast Louisiana and South of New Orleans, and also in the Western part of the state in the city of Lake Charles, which most of that stuff did not end up making it into the book. But um, 
But in any case, they they all kept calling me back and saying, well, there's this other thing that's happening that you shouldn't really know about. And it's that they they built like one of the largest industrial facilities ever created by mankind, like on the waterfront here. And I'm a little worried that it's going to flood and blow up. Um, and I didn't really know. I mean, I knew about fracking. I knew about the, you know, theoretical case for exporting natural gas, you know, across the ocean to Asia and Europe, but I hadn't really been aware of how much it had grown on the Gulf. And so, I mean, basically some of the last parts of the Gulf coast that were untouched by industry have now been taken over by these facilities, which are really monumental in scale. And the, the purpose of them, as I'm sure people on this call know, but just in case, like the purpose is to take excess you know, methane gas that's fracked and and liquefy it and super condense it down to like one two hundredth of its volume and ship it overseas for other countries to use, right? And it's become like extra, um, it's become extra, a, a huge part of the Biden administration's foreign policy since the Russian invasion of Ukraine because this gas is supposed to displace Russian gas, right? So, yeah, and it's 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 taken over there. Like it really is an um, these f facilities. Even for somebody like myself, and I'm sure everyone here who's seen oil refineries before, they are unbelievably large. And there's a the few places left that where you can still fish. There's still untouched marshland, and now a lot of that stuff is disappearing too. And um, so it's really jarring because I went back down there a couple of times and sort of saw that stuff happening. It was it was really jarring. I know that we're waiting uh, any day now for the Biden administration's um, ruling on whether they're going to approve a really huge project um, in Louisiana that would be 20 times more polluting than Willow in the Arctic that was so controversial. So, of course, we're hoping that... Uh, the Biden administration doesn't do this. Have you been surprised at all by the Biden administration and how um, fossil fuel friendly they've they've ended up being? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's really hard. I don't, I don't really, I don't really know to what extent it was surprising to me, but it is like a really interesting set of develop they they really seem to have tried to do this thing where they've like threaded this need every time they do like a ruling on leasing on public lands for instance or an offshore lease sale they try to thread this needle where they kind of make nobody happy like and, and it's really fascinating to watch because i'm not sure who the like intended audience is for these decisions sometimes yeah but with lng specifically though it's interesting because they really inherited a system from the Obama and Trump administrations that was really already set up. Like this stuff was already really roaring. It was Obama and then Trump really continued it. And I think that however much they might've been subject to, you know, domestic political pressure to stop mm -hmm. permanent. And I think they really were at the beginning of um, the administration. Like it's it's been a huge issue for you know, climate groups, et cetera. I just think it was going to like especially once like the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. I just think that the political calculus that they made, especially Biden himself, like with his history of like, you know, like sort of NATO and foreign policy, et cetera. I just think that they were never going to, they were never going to clamp down on this. And it's a really interesting like issue where it's both yeah. about foreign policy and domestic policy. So I guess it's a little surprising, but I also think that the LNG thing in particular is kind of a natural continuation and it got supercharged by by Russia. Um, Willow was more surprising to me, uh, although perhaps it shouldn't have been. Well, can you talk a little bit more about the economic and environmental justice issues and the historic racist policies that have led to displacement? Yeah, I think that maybe the easiest way is just like to to kind of give an example. I mean, it's sort of it's easy to understand the theoretical reason for this, right? Like the, it, when a hurricane flies over a town and drops like 50 inches of rain on it, the number one, you know, deciding factor in whether your home gets displaced is not like did the rain fall on you? The rain falls on everyone. It's it's where do you live within the urban fabric of a city, right? Do you live in a neighborhood that's especially prone to flooding or one that's not? Do you have a house that can withstand hurricane force winds or do you not? 
And I think like, as everyone probably understands, the number one factor that determines this in the United States is race. Like every American city and every American developed area is influenced by segregation and redlining, or at least almost all of them are. And, you know, those areas tend to be less resilient and more vulnerable. And this takes like a number of different shapes. Like it looks kind of different in every place. And I think like a good example, two good examples, right? I wrote a, a chapter about a town in North Carolina where the African-American neighborhood was on the most flood prone land. It was land that nobody wanted. And and then it got flooded in the storm and the and FEMA bought it out and raised the neighborhood. Um, R-A-Z-E-D, uh, not R-A-I-S-E-D. Um, but then if you go down to Miami, like you find that the Rock Ridge, like the middle of the city, the most elevated land is actually where the African-American communities have historically been redlined to because they weren't allowed on the beach, which is where obviously a lot of the vulnerability to sea level rises. So there's always an inequality and, you know, in every case, right, race, pe people of color fare worse, but it looks really different depending on the specific history of the, the built environment in any given place. So I, we know that there is a controversy involving the Department of Homeland Security, and there are people and policymakers who think that FEMA should be moved out of the agency. It was originally established by Jimmy Carter, and then uh, President Bush created Homeland Security in 2003 after the terrorist attacks. And it has just a huge agenda, customs, border and immigration enforcement, emergency response, and anti-terrorism, cybersecurity. And when you look on their website, their highest priority is fighting terrorism. So as this controversy really plays out, what would you recommend about the process to make after a disaster happens more humane and just less chaotic? Yeah, I mean, I will say that you know, as a reporter, like I am always like being encouraged to like sort of like tell multiple sides of a given issue. But in the issue of like FEMA being under DHS, I don't think I've met a single person who's educated on that issue or who works on that issue who thinks that there's any benefit to a disaster response agency being housed under the Homeland Security Department. I mean, I just don't. There's just no case for it. Like, I mean, there just isn't. Uh, and so I would, and every, almost every like emergency manager would either say the worst thing they could say is it wouldn't make a difference if it was taken out of VHS. But I think most people think like it would be way better if it was a cabinet level agency. Um, now there's, there's a hundreds of things that FEMA could do to make the response to disasters better. But I just want to focus on a, one thing here because it actually just happened. And I think it's flying under the radar a little bit. The Biden administration just released a new set of rules for FEMA's response to disasters, where they now, for the first time ever, are going to give out like cat unrestricted cash aid to people in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. This is something that they would say under their breath that they needed congressional authority to do for years yeah. and years and years. And Dan Criswell, the Biden administration's FEMA director, decided or figured out or realized or whatever that they don't need congressional authorization to do this. The statute is very clear. And so now starting in March, they've taken the recommendation that like I, everyone else who writes about disasters, everyone who's ever survived a disaster has always said, and just, you shouldn't have to wait for the state to request aid in order for people to get these, you know, it's either a debit card or a direct deposit. And, and furthermore, they're also gonna make it possible to spend money on, to give you upfront uh, money for housing expenses in the first two weeks after disaster, where previously you had to get reimbursed for like rent, et cetera, hotel fees. Um, and this is stuff that's like, this is elementary, you would say, right? <laughs> like, um, but it, but it's finally happened. And so it's it was really refreshing to see that. Like, and I know people that I spoke to for the book, I talked to them about this and they were just like, that's going to make such a huge difference for the trauma and the sort of like financial immiseration after disasters. So that's like, 
that's a really I mean it's kind of an unqualified good thing that happened it, it hadn't hasn't gotten very much attention but it's amazing that it took them so long to start doing this I mean it's just actually incredible like well that does sound really hopeful so we know that climate change can be a polarizing topic. When you were conducting interviews, how did people talk about climate change? Did they see a correlation between what was happening to them or was there resistance to that? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because there was such a diversity of answers. And I spoke to people who they were extremely conservative and they were really in the bullseye of climate change. And for some of them, it had altered the way that they saw, you know, the relationship. It had made them believe in something like climate change, right? They understood that this wasn't normal, right? Especially in cases of sea level rise, right? Where you can't chalk it up to bad luck, right? It's just, it's, it's up and it's not going back down. So and that had changed people's, but then also there were people who really just didn't, they pointed to the other causes, right? They said, well, I was in a neighborhood that never should have been developed because it's in a flood zone. That's true. I bombed my home. I wasn't warned about the potential fire risk. Like, that's true. And a lot of them just refused to, they just did not, they don't believe in the science of climate change and they don't think that they have anything to do with climate change. And it was a really interesting like process for the book. Like, how much does that matter to me if I know and like I have pretty clear evidence that what happened to them was because of climate change in part. Um, and so in the end, I decided that, you know, the one's personal views like don't really matter for the purpose of the book. And right. I told everyone that everyone knew the kind of book project I was writing. Um, but yeah, it was so it was so diverse. There were so many different views on climate change, more than I had really imagined that there even were like more points on the spectrum than, you know, people like sort of half believe in it or they believe in some parts of it, but not others. So yeah, there's a, like a lot of different views out there. Um, but everyone, you know, when it comes to things like FEMA, et cetera, like the way that we had, like almost everybody was on the same page about that, even if they, you know, thought that climate change wasn't real and they had just like been struck by bad luck in terms of a hurricane, et cetera. Well, it's been, um, I don't know, two, three years since you conducted those interviews. Do you think people's yeah. thinking over this time has changed? Are people beginning to recognize climate change causes these disasters? Yeah, I mean, the there's a lot of really interesting and inconsistent data on this. Like some the polling is all over the place in terms of whether people believe in climate change more now than they did. Way more people say it is affecting their decisions about where to buy a home and where to live. Like according to studies that like Redfin and Zillow, these real estate companies have done, it seems like it's really affecting people's choices about, you know, voluntary migration and where to live. Um, but I don't know that it's really I mean, I just and and anecdotally, right, like I met numerous people who had been blown, their homes have been blown off their heads and they suddenly, you know, understood that this was a really big problem. Um, but I don't know if like overall and I think the last thing I'll say is I think that there's a lot more public attention on the issue. There's a lot more media coverage of present tense climate impacts in the U.S. And it seems like in general, the issue has gotten way more oxygen than it did, for instance, in you know the four years between 2016 and 2020, like I just feel like people really understand that it's here now, but I don't know about the level of like how many people are making that connection. And it seems like every poll finds something different. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot more media coverage to climate change for sure. So I thought your chapter on Arizona, Arizona did a really terrific job of laying out the tragic cost of of the water crisis to alfalfa and cotton farmers. And uh, Food and Water Watch recently published a report on the Colorado River Basin. And of course, feed crops continue to be the largest consumers of water in, in the seven states of the Colorado River Basin. They use about 55% of the water. And of course, the reason that cotton out and our alfalfa are being grown in Arizona is because of federal policy. And um, 
It used to be subsidies and price protection for farmers, and today the aid comes in insurance subsidies. So right now, uh, in the next few months, the farm bill is going to be, um, well, it's been being debated for the last several months. Do you think that uh, as part of the discussion on federal agriculture policy, that the water crisis should be one of the factors considered? Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, and there's any number of different ways that you can go about that. And I think that in, in prior administrations and previous, like the bills have tried to address this through, I guess, like the carrot method, if you will, there are, are you know, like the, uh, there's like rural grants and stuff that are supposed to make what, you know, improve water efficiency, et cetera. The Inflation Reduction Act contained like a, a big chunk of money negotiated by Senator Sinema to incentivize uh, efficiency improvements and farms in the lower basin of the river. But I think that like at a certain point, uh, the, <laughs> the stick element is probably... I don't know. There just seems to be diminishing returns on the carrot. And there's people, you know, experts who I speak to about the Colorado River who are concerned that like the solution to the most recent drought crisis was to give a billion plus dollars to the farmers to not farm because you're kind of, you know, you're you're giving a man a fish there. Um, and I think like crop insurance reform is probably I don't know that they're going to do this in the farm bill, but it's probably the main way that you would affect the kind of land use change that is necessary to deal with the the water portfolio of agriculture in the United States. Like it is just a massive consumptive use problem, as you know, um, and it's supported by federal subsidies in the form of crop insurance. And that is getting really expensive and it just doesn't do anything. In fact, it disincentivizes adaptation. So you have to deal with that problem eventually. Um, and then the big question, which they're dealing with in the Central Valley of California right now, is just how do you deal with the downstream economic impacts and the labor impacts of, you know, taking agricultural land out of production? And there are various estimates for how bad of a problem that is. Some people think it wouldn't be that bad. Some people think it'd be really bad. But that's the big policy problem. Once you once you have the political bravery to come at the crop insurance or to come at unrestricted groundwater use, then you have to figure out, you know, how you're going to deal with the inevitable political blowback and the economic, you know, downstream impacts. That is certainly true. And uh, with this farm bill cycle, who knows when there'll be a bill with the dysfunction in Congress. So. Yeah, I don't know. They can't pass regular bills. So. No, they can't. <laughs> certainly can't. What predictions do you have about where we're going to see the biggest climate uh, displacements in coming years? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I think that you'll start to see, um, in addition to the, the rural communities along the, the Gulf Coast, in addition to some of the, the desert communities, that I wrote about where they're really dependent on agriculture, you know, like a lot of the laborers really depend on up and down agricultural economies. I think that a big area, and I can say this because I'm from there, I think Florida is really actually kind of overdue for some, some big time out migration. Like Miami's population has started to fall and the homeowners insurance problem there has become so acute that even if you don't own a home, you still are subject to massive tax assessments so that they can prop up the, the windstorm insurance market. And home ownership in Florida has become, for people on the lower end of the, the, the income scale within the population of homeowners, right? It is pushing people out of being able to afford homes. And it is like actively, and like I'm a renter, there's nothing wrong with being a renter, but for a lot of people, it's destabilizing like their housing situation in really, really big ways. Um, and so it's not just like, you own a home in Florida and it's going to be underwater because you live in Key Biscayne. It's like you you own a home anywhere in Florida and because the state insurance market is so unstable and like and because the damages from hurricanes are so intense, you're just going to it's just really expensive to live there 
at all, you know? And so that is, um, that's going to be a big, it's eventually like inevitably it's going to start pushing people like Alabama or Georgia, like politically and like culturally and geographically similar places that don't have this acute economic problem in the housing market that Florida does. So that might not be this year, but like, I do think it's, I do think it's coming. No, that makes sense. You know, I really liked the concept that you discussed in the last chapter about the UN affirming the, the inalienable right of climate refugees to social and economic stability. So you've been out speaking and discussing the book. Do you have any more to say on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think that in the in the years since the book, since I finished the book at, at Grist, I've done a lot of reporting on like international negotiations over what's called like loss and damage or climate reparations, right? Like big funding from you know the the wealthiest countries in the world to the the least wealthy countries in the world. Right. Um, and I think that like it really is like even if you take the most optimistic view of where we are with the energy transition, right? And even if you ride the wave of like an immense amount of private investment in renewables and a seeming political consensus around at least like limiting the future development of fossil fuels or at least an, uh, an avowed consensus to do that, you still find that we are really nowhere on the politics of and I just reparations is the word that a lot of people who are like in this space use. So I'm just going to use it like and you can call it loss and damage too. We're nowhere on restitution to developing countries and like and we're even farther away from like a political agreement that would legitimize or, you know, enable like cross border migration, you know, in, in all cases from climate change. Like that's really far away. But I think that like the next conversation in the international sphere over the next five to 10 years as the energy transition begins to get going is going to be like what how can we how can we as an international community assign responsibility and which countries are going to be willing to take that responsibility like scotland for instance has like they were, were out in front of this like they really started a individual loss and damage fund which has funded like flood relief in bangladesh for people who yeah. suffered from flooding like it's helped rehouse them like this is the kind of thing that we need to see like a ton more of and it's just like going to be a huge global problem to grapple with and i think you have to grapple with that monetary question on your way to a question about like the political rights of of climate refugee so that was like a really like that was like my, my moonshot thing of like you know you should be able to go anywhere if you're displaced by climate change that's like what the un says and it should be a reality but i think in between that there's a really fascinating conversation about funding that's just beginning to get going and, and and it's it's really really critical well i know that you talk about a growing climate resilience movement and you talk about projects that disaster proof or develop adaptations in at risk areas and focus more on investment in those types of efforts rather than just waiting for a disaster to happen. Are there any um, benefits to doing both at once? Do you want to say a little bit more about climate resilience? Yeah, I mean, I think that like, if you look at the the project that the what's known as the Green Climate Fund, like has this is the UN financing authority is such as it is for adaptation and for climate funding in in less wealthy countries. Like what they the best projects, the most successful ones are always what they call cross cutting, right? So it's like wow. it's a an e scooter mobility project that also has like a it also sort of tries to redirect traffic away from these like really flood prone highway tunnels onto like city streets that have bioswales on them right or it's like a solar panel project it's like 
distributed solar in an African country that also like, you know, en enables them to get off like a faulty power grid or something, or like, you know, allows them to have like more consistent water access. So there's, there's a huge, I, I really think that like, and it's honestly, like, it's not just like in casual conversation, like the United Nations negotiators also have this problem. They also see mitigation and adaptation as a binary. And now with loss and damage, it's like a trinary. And they're like, constantly trying to deal with these issues as discrete issues. I really think that there's a lot of opportunities to do both at once. And like, there's op also opportunities in the United States. Like there's a, this is everyone's favorite example, but like, there, like there's a thing called like agrovoltaics, right? Where you can like put solar panels on agricultural land, right? Like it protects the agricultural crops from overheating. It also generates power or you can line canals with solar panels, right? To decrease evapotranspiration and also generate power. So there, there's all kinds of ways. It's not a perfect, you know, overlap, of course, yeah. but I do think that like most people who are in the, the UN space, international space, they always feel like adaptation is getting short shrift mm -hmm. because they feel like it, people don't understand that it, it can be coupled with like mitigation and, that, you know, just a, a huge amount of investment in resilience. Renewable energy is also a form of resilience against right. climate shocks because it's far more reliable than than fossil power under those circumstances right yeah. so so yeah it's it's really important to think about both at once i think well i can't believe that our time is almost up because we promised to save some time so that the audience can ask questions and i know kate's been monitoring um the questions so Let's see what she has for us. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone submitting um, in some questions for us. We've got um, a lot of questions for you, Jake. So let's see how many we can get through here. Um, we have had a couple of similar questions um, along the, the thread of where are people moving to in order to avoid impacts of climate change? And then the second thread of that is, um, how will this type of movement impact local communities who are already living there um, in terms of like food and water resources? And I, I know that you touch on this in your book and you mentioned the concept of climate gentrification. So can you talk more about that, how you're seeing this type of movement play out um, and what do you expect to continue? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, at the end of the book, like I, I mentioned a couple places like Duluth, Minnesota and Buffalo and Cincinnati that have attempted to sell themselves as like climate havens, right? Like they are uh, in theory, uh, at least like very safe from the effects of climate change that we've, you know, experienced thus far. Although of course they're not, they're not uh, immune to all climate effects and they're not immune to extreme weather, certainly as is the case in Buffalo. Like, but I, I don't think that that is in the offing yet. Like, I think it's like, it's a little bit farther away maybe than those cities would like because they would like more people to come there. Um, but I do think that like, as you have places that emerge as like the winners from climate impacts, right? And those places might be farther south than we might think like Orlando, like Dallas, Nashville, these places could really benefit a lot from migration away from the, the coastal parts of the US South and the hottest parts of the country. There are obvious impacts on local infrastructure, housing prices, water supply. And in many cases, right, like you could create just as much of a, a chaotic housing market in the winning place, so to speak, the receiving community as in the, the losing community, right? And so that's why, like, I think, like, that's why it's really hard to solve this problem without a national, like a, a federal uh, policy on the where to build and how to build and like where to channel investment. Like it's just, it's really difficult to do this at the local level for everyone to, because it, there's a kind of tragedy of the commons thing, right? Where people don't want to lose a lot of population. They also don't really want to gain a lot of population too fast. So yeah, I don't know that the climate, and because then there's issues like, as you say, like climate gentrification, which is a, a, a poorly understood theoretical concept like there's very little research literature on it but it's clear that when a lot of people move somewhere because they think it's safe then you have issues with that right like and there's obvious local impact just like any form of gentrification or any commodity speculation rush so yeah it's a very it's a very complex and, and none too encouraging topic unfortunately thank you 
Uh, this next question is from Sarah. Um, can you share an example of a municipality that is addressing displacement well? Maybe um, an example from your book of a place that faced a disaster and was able to support residents through it, whether relocating or rebuilding. Yeah, there's there's a cool example that I don't think it went into the book, but it's about a place. So I, I wrote about sea level rise in Norfolk, Virginia on the East Coast. And I spoke to these people from this nonprofit called Wetlands Watch who were trying to find like creative solutions to sea level rise in the housing market. And they had been talking about this idea, which they they realized like two weeks ago. They just got it to it's basically like a rolling climate easement where basically the <laughs> They built like an uh, education center for sea level rise. And as part of the, the deed structure, as the water claims parts of it, they will surrender their ownership of those parts of the property, right? So it's like a built-in managed retreat or climate migration legal structure that took them years to figure out, right? But they basically have a, they arranged with the city of Norfolk that they would transfer ownership to places that are under permanent inundation as sea levels rise. This is just the kind of thing that like, and basically like what they what they want to do is eventually make this a condition of new development in risky areas, right? If you want to build somewhere, not only do you have to potentially pay to help, you know, do infrastructure as like an impact fee, but you also have to agree to this easement, right? So that you're putting a time limit on the amount of time that you can keep developing one place over and over again. This was just like an incredibly creative way of dealing with like what I had considered to be an intractable problem of like private property rights in the United States. Um, and I was, I'm amazed that they were able to do it. And it's just really, really cool. Like, I just thought it was neat. Like, uh, and, and hopefully it gets like, it becomes generic in that city and they managed to make it more widespread, but even the one easement took them like five years to do. And it was pretty impressive. Awesome. That's great. Um, this next question is from Kelly, who has a question sort of on your on your process. Um, she asked, what was your experience like finding and interviewing people? Were they eager to share their stories? Um, and as a follow up, have you stayed in touch with any of the folks that you interviewed and how are they doing years out? Yeah, I mean, it was there was a definitely a mix like some people really weren't they really didn't want to talk about it. And I to a certain extent, the book is like self selected from people who did. Like I really, first of all, there's so many people who have to, who have experienced this. That I didn't really want to push um, if someone didn't want to relive like the worst moment of their life. But other people, um, they felt like it was really cathartic to talk about this. And they really got, you know, or they were initially hesitant. But then, you know, after a tiny little bit of, of encouragement, they would open up a lot. And they would later say that they were really glad that they talked about it and, and even more glad right, to see it in print um but you know it's it's hard because like i've never experienced anything like this like i've never lost my home to a storm like this and i just you know was constantly asking people to just talk to me about you know floating out of their neighborhood on a refrigerator or something just really gruesome and like um and but i was you know i was i was surprised i think by how easy it was for for many people to talk about it and how much it's it seemed like they got out of it, which wasn't isn't always the case as a reporter. Like you can't always offer someone something in return for just sharing their story with you. But a lot of people really felt like um, that, that they did get something out of it. Um, another question, this one we got submitted in advance. Um, you know, climate change doesn't recognize borders. What climate caused migration trends are you seeing worldwide? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. Um, and I think like, the difficulty is that it gets routed through conversations about immigration and, and refugee status in the, you know, developed countries where this happens, right? Like in Europe and, and the United States, like this is a problem of refugees from North Africa, or it's a problem of, of migration from Central America. A lot of these migration movements are caused by climate change. Like they, they really, really are. It's, it's drought, it's like water shortages in Saharan Africa. It's, you know, like coffee crops being destroyed in the Northern Triangle. Like, and we just don't have the, I mean, I don't have to tell anybody that we don't have the political um, framework right now in the United States to process it that way. Like we just don't, um, there's just, nobody wants to talk about it that way. Um, and there's kind of a, there's kind of a, 
a fear that some people have, right, which is like, if you do say climate change is going to cause a lot of migration to the United States, that will could lead to an increase of xenophobia, right? So some of the like big predictions of like a billion people moving are weaponized by opponents of immigration. Um, and I, I and they're probably exaggerated anyway, a billion people is a lot. Um, but like, yeah, I just, and I think that there's a lot of inter intra continental like movement within movement within the African continent, especially on the Horn of Africa. You see a lot of people leaving Somalia and Eritrea, going to countries like Kenya that have more water. There's a ton of movement within the Northern Triangle toward Mexico, obviously. And I think there's a lot of things that we just don't we just don't know about because there's just not enough research on that kind of especially movement between what's what are known as and I should say like least developed countries is it is the the term that the negotiating group uses in cli in climate conversations like it, developed and least developed and developing are really they're always really fraught words but that's like the word that the negotiators use that's why I use it um that's like their self-identification term um like movement with between those countries is, is very little studied and I don't don't think we know much about the climate drivers of that movement yet Thank you. Um, this one just came in as a follow up to something that you touched on. Uh, you just mentioned lack of a centralized national level push or policy in the US um, thinking about this issue. In your interviewing, did you come across anyone suggesting policies or program ideas for addressing this? Um, and then we had a similar question in the chat from Amy um, about what would be a good way to incentivize more adaptation. So any policy recommendations you came across there as well? Yeah. I. Yeah, I mean, I just, it's really like the the thinking on what a national adaptation strategy would look like. I mean, most people will, won't go any farther than saying like that we should have one because I think that they, even experts, because I feel like they, it's just, it's a process that would have to involve hearing from innumerable stakeholders and would be like a massive experiment in kind of like democratic participation if you were to do it well. Um, but I think like, the, the main thing that people would say in the short term, right, is that we just need to be spending a lot more money to figure out what works in terms of resilience projects, right? Like the Biden administration, as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, has like somewhere like $50 billion to spend on, which is $50 billion is not a lot compared to the, the need, but it's an enormous amount compared to the amount that had ever been obligated before by Congress. So they have a this money is basically like a, a basically like a a, a lab, right? It's basically like a, a test run or prototype for what you would do. So they're granting it out to all these states and localities and tribes and stuff and just letting them basically spend it on what they want. It's like a grant, a competitive grant process. And I think like the main thing that people would say we need to do is observe those projects, figure out what works. Like, is it a seawall? Is it a living shoreline? Is it like a I mean, I don't think it's a desalination plant, but, you know, like, is it desalination? Is it wastewater reuse, et cetera? Um, and once we figure out what works, like quintuple, tenfold, et cetera, the funding, right? That would be like a first, that'd be a first step before you start to think about how does a federal government channel investment from, away from some places and toward others, which is a very fraught question that I don't think we have good answers on how to approach that yet, but that eventually it's going to have to be talked about. And I know we're at time here, so we'll just do one more quick question. Marilyn is asking, your book was so informative and well-written um, as this crisis continues. Do you have any plans for a second edition? Uh, well, the paperback is coming out in, in a month uh, and it does include an updated afterword. I don't think I will be able to do another book about this topic, but I do really want to write about the the energy transition in the United States and similarly write about communities that are being affected by the, the either the, the turbulence in fossil fuel markets and the, the growth of renewables, et cetera. I think it's kind of one of the next big economic transitions and like lived experience transitions that's going to happen in the US. And that's kind of where my my research is taking me now. So I have to, I can't say more than that. Not that it's that exciting, well, but I can't. have to follow, <laughs> follow you for the latest yeah. update. Stay tuned. Um, awesome. Um, so we are at time here. So I am going to wrap us up on Q&A, uh, but I want to thank everyone so much for sending in your great questions. Um, and everyone, please join me in the chat in thanking Jake for joining us this evening. 
Um, we're just incredibly grateful for your time and the way that you've really used your platform to give a voice to people who are experiencing these issues um, and calling for national attention to it. Um, so I Thanks do have so a much. couple, yeah, of course. Um, I have a couple quick closing uh, reminders before I let everybody go. Um, you know, first, as we've been hearing this evening, um, there are clearly some very big structural challenges that will require significant policy changes to address. And just the urgency of this issue just all also really demands that we do everything that we can right now to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and that's exactly what Food and Water Watch is doing. And I know that's exactly what all of you here tonight are doing as well. So if you would like to increase the impact that we can have as a community, please consider making a donation or becoming a Food and Water Watch member today. For the month of January, um, all gifts are tripled. So whether that's a one-time gift or you're signing up to be a partner to make monthly donations, your gift will be matched. Um, and you can also join us in the next few months for some other upcoming events that we're hosting, including our February discussion about how we're using the courts to reshape the way we regulate and protect water and air quality. And in March, you can join Food and Water Action's election launch party. It's definitely not too early to start thinking about getting out the vote. Uh, and finally, you can take our survey um, to share your feedback on our Livable Future Live event series, which will help us shape the, our programming for the rest of the year. And don't forget that by filling that out, you'll have a chance to win a copy of The Great Displacement. Um, and that's all for tonight. Um, I know many folks are interested in the recording, so just keep an eye out on your inbox. I'll be emailing that out to all of you tomorrow. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us this evening, and I hope we'll see you next time.